Y'all, we kind of saw it coming from a mile away. John Pryor is going to take the root in his opening statements that it was all Alex and Lori, and we're going to talk about it in today's video. Hello, Sofa Squad, and welcome back to the sofa. Sofa's back there. Roscoe's joining us for today's video, and my name's Paul, and I'll be joining you too if you're new. What we're going to be talking about today is kind of a quick video. We're going to be revisiting the Daybell case, specifically Chad Daybell in this, and we're going to specifically be looking at his opening statements that were given by his attorney, John Pryor. We're going to look at a few clips of those, talk about them, and that's kind of it. Now, if you want to follow Roscoe and I somewhere besides the U and the tubes, we'll go on to the Insta and the Gram, the Instagram. It's on the screen. It's in the description. So very quickly, in case you're new to this case, uh, this is a very complex, a very uh, sad, tragic, and very long case. Lori Daybell has already been tried and convicted on these charges that now her husband, I guess you could say, unfortunately, Chad Daybell is being tried for. And these are crimes against their children. Or I'm sorry, not their children, but Lori's children. Also, there's going to be Tammy Daybell. There's numerous victims in this case, okay? Now, as with most trials, this one opened up with opening statements. We've been kind of on edge to hear what is the excuse that Chad could possibly come up with that Lori Daybell's children were found buried in his backyard, okay? Um, but they seemingly have come up with a reason whether it will hold water, we will see. So the way this video will work is we're gonna look at some clips of those opening statements and just talk about them as we go and at the end. So let's go ahead and get started with the first clip. Now remember, this is John Pryor, Chad Daybell's attorney, giving the opening arguments in the case against Chad Daybell. And we talked about evidence. And the judge gave you an instruction to talk to you a little bit about uh, you take into consideration the facts of this case, not be distracted by other things. Don't be distracted by speculation. Don't be distracted by guesses or assumptions or hunches. It all comes down to facts and evidence. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the facts and evidence of this case. Now, this is going to be his major point that he's going to drive home, and we'll find out why here shortly. Any case, obviously, you don't want them going on, on speculation, all this type of stuff. And of course, this has gone on for years, y'all. There's tons of speculation, tons of this, but we also know a lot because of just how in-depth and covered this case has been, but also because Lori's already gone to trial, right? We will probably learn more from this case as well, but nonetheless. Now, Pryor is going to give us like a bit of a Chad Daybell history that we didn't ask for, right? Um, Chad Daybell went on a mission uh, early on in his life, and when he returns, he met his wife wife, Tammy Daybell. Now, remember, Tammy Daybell is no longer here. Um, it is alleged that she did not die of natural causes, but uh, Pryor will have, you know, a different opinion on that, and we'll get to that. Uh, another fact that I discovered, and you'll hear a little bit about, is that Chad had an extended um, uh, engagement, had an extended, by his faith standards, uh, uh, romance before they got married. Uh, Chad and Tammy dated for approximately six months. Okay. Now, again, apparently, allegedly, according to their religion, their beliefs, six months is an extended period to date before marriage. Whatever floats your boat, whatever works for you, right? Uh, to each their own on that. Now, he's also going to talk about, you know, them getting married, their children. They had several children together, moving back to Idaho and starting this publishing company that we've all kind of become familiar with. Tammy managed it. Tammy was the brains behind the, uh, the company. And uh, Tammy basically took the reins and did everything that was necessary to move this publishing company. Can't imagine that she was the brains and Chad wasn't. That's a big shocker there. I guess he was just the artistic person behind it with zingers like loins of fire and one foot in the grave. I literally can't roll my eyes hard enough, but let's continue. But he writes about his premonitions. He writes about um, good and evil and what it means to be good, what it means to be evil. He writes about dark and light. He writes about um, subjects that are a little darker, like death, and maybe the coming of uh, the end of, of things and, and when his savior in his mind is going to come back and, and maybe uh, there'll be some kind of a redemption of some sort. 
yeah, he writes about dark things. You can say that again. Now, this is what's interesting is you hear prior setting everybody up here because, I mean, again, if you follow this case and you'll know the stuff that Chad was writing about and spouting on about is just like next level, right? You know, this whole thing of we rated people from dark to light and this and that and blah, 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 blah. You know, and some of it started off as these books that he would write, um, which were, you know, based on his faith and whatnot, but then clearly there comes a left turn and a right turn along the way that takes him down this absolutely bizarre road that we hear about. And again, Pryor's gonna have to write about this because this jury's getting ready to suffer through all of that information and these bizarre belief systems that they have to introduce in order to connect the dots. Now then he's gonna round all this back out prior to Chad going to these conferences, these meetings, trying to sell the said books. And he's going to bring things back around to the elusive first meeting with Lori. And he was there in one of his booths trying to promote his books and he laid them out there. And this beautifully stunning woman named Lori Vallow comes up and she starts giving him a lot of attention and she pursued him. And she encouraged him. And you'll hear testimony that she went so far as to grab behind the booth and um, sort of help him in trying to sell some of his books. She obviously had an interest, and maybe she felt that he was this, this publisher, or maybe she had an opinion. You'll hear testimony about that. Now, he is going to start painting her out to be well, a core whore. I mean, he is about to lay the line out with Lori in a very professional manner, I guess you could say. Um, you know, the whole part about her jumping behind the books and all this type of stuff, you can tell what Pryor, number one, needs to do for his client, but number one, no, number two, is doing in that, you know, she pursued him. She went after him. She jumped behind there. She started selling his books. She must have saw that in him. And I do question that aspect of it because clearly Lori saw something in Chad that she wanted, right? I think this is how she operates. There is something about him that she wanted and whether it was like, oh my gosh, she's this publisher with all these books, you know, he's this and that, you know, I want that notoriety. I mean, I don't know, right? But clearly there was something there. So I definitely agree with Pryor on this. Now Pryor will then go on to say, you know what, this happens. Chad goes back to his little nice life with Tammy Daybell, you know, and like this very, you know, just nice blissful meeting of two people and all the stuff. But then things will start to take a turn for the narrative on Lori. Uh, let's hear what he's got to say about her. And Lori Vallow was a different story. Lori Vallow was someone who right out of high school married her first husband. You'll hear testimony about that. That marriage was very short-lived, very short-lived. She then married husband number two a few years later. And again, very short-lived marriage. And there's some testimony indication that there were some same problems with the marriage that uh, caused the breakup. But the concern seems to be, the theme seems to be that uh, Lori's brother, Alex, and you're going to hear about Alex Cox, I feel like when he says these things about Lori, you saw me like this, like he wants us to clutch our pearls and be like, she was married twice. Oh, my Lord, mercy. You know, kind of a thing, right? You know, but he's painting this narrative of like she has these like quick concessions, but you see what he's doing. Here's Chad. He went on a mission. He came back. He did the right thing. He even dated Tammy for long term, six months before they got hooked up. And then here's this streetwalker over here named Lori. You know, she got married out of high school, left that man, did tawdry thing, you know, that kind of a thing, right? Completely painted on that way. And then we introduce Alex. You know, Alex right in there with them, the little lap dog that would go do everything. And let's hear how Pryor describes that. Alex Cox was Lori's protector. Alex Cox would do anything and everything to protect, aid, and assist Lori Vallon in whatever her endeavors. Yeah, to the point of it being super creepy, if you ask me, okay? The things that we've heard about their relationship from the whole time, right? I mean, if you followed this, you'll see that literally Alex is her lapdog. He just runs and does everything. 
all the way down to what he seemingly allegedly did to the victims in this case, right? Uh, it was nonstop, and I think that Lori completely played into that. No, unbridled question. Anything. <clears throat> and if Alex Cox even perceived that there was a problem, Alex Cox reacted. You're going to hear testimony that in 2007, I believe it was in August of 2007, Lori Vallow had finished up going through her third marriage with Joseph Wright. Now, here we're going to get involved in some of the past marriages and the way that Alex was intertwined in that and coming to Lori's rescue to basically do her dirty work against these men, but also intertwined with this, you're just hearing about how she quickly went through all these different husbands and whatnot, you know, it being a pattern and everything. Yes. Alex definitely was not a good boy, right? Uh, I would almost wonder if he had some kind of feelings towards Lori. It's very odd how he un, just non-provoked, whatever it is, I'm going to go do it for her, ask no questions. And it's very obvious to the onlookers or people who followed this or maybe even people that knew them, of seeing this pattern where it's like, well, she kind of exploits this, right? Especially when she was with Chad, you know, he kind of was their fall guy. He was going to be their excuse. You know, and I wonder if in Alex's last moments, if he had the realization of, I've been duped. I've been duped by Chad. I've been duped by Lori. None of this was real. Because other people, I think Zulema and people who testified will say, oh, he believed all this stuff. Like, absolutely believed it, no questions asked. Right, and we'll probably hear that again on the stand. But also, he's the obvious fall guy in this situation because he's not here. I almost argued to say that in those last moments of his life, Chad was walking him down the path of whatever happened to Alex. I do not believe he left here naturally. Um, I believe that somehow it was assisted something I don't know. And I think that somehow Lori and Chad had a way thing to do with it. Whether they just manipulated him into it, I don't know. But I just, I do not believe this man just passed naturally, okay? Uh, that's so for speculation. I don't know any more than y'all do, right? Um, but I wonder if in those moments he was like, I've been duped. Or if all the way to the end he was like, I'm going to protect Lori. I'm going to go down for her. It was a tumultuous, you know, your testimony that it was a tumultuous marriage. A terrible marriage. And Lori Dallow made accusations against Joseph Ryan of abusing their child, Tylee. Yes, the same time. And during one of the visits of 2007, folks, I, I want to tell you, you're going to hear testimony that in 2007, Chad Daybell didn't even know Lori Vallow existed. So again, here, you hear him going into this, the, the situations, you know, with Joseph. We're going to get into the one with Charles here in a little bit. You know, this whole thing is just a kettle pot and you see it brewing and brewing and brewing and brewing. Now, I guess one thing that I'll have to pause and sit here and say is this goes through my mind here constantly. Okay. So you're blaming it on like, we can only pay attention to facts and evidence. We're going to get into some of that stuff of the evidence he's going to talk about here in just a second. But I guess my question would be, are you, and maybe they don't even have to provide this because it's like, if they're trying to say, Chad had nothing to do with this, this is Lori and Alex. Well then what's their motivation for doing it? Right. As a juror, I would need to know, okay, well then, what was the motivation, right? I mean, this is serious. I have a better time believing that Chad had something to do with it than Lori, even though I think they're both completely capable. I don't want to think that the mother of the children could willingly do this, even though clearly that's in some way, fashion, what she did. But Alex Cox, after one of the exchanges and the visitations with Tylee, Alex Cox approached Joseph Ryan and shot him with a taser and assaulted him was eventually charged with aggravated assault, was eventually put in jail, and had this on his record. And there was representation and facts would suggest that at the time Joseph Ryan feared for his life. This was a serious situation. Now, again, this is just talking more in depth about that situation with Joseph Ryan, with Alex, the record, what he did to him, the whole nine yards, right? Now, obviously, Joseph Ryan is no longer here to tell his side of the story. Um, but it's very tragic. I mean, I consider him another victim by proxy, if you will, um, of this family, I guess you could say, right? Of Lori's toxicness. Um, but again, no questions asked. Alex comes, does this, and this is like a precursor to see what he does to Charles Vallow. But it set the pattern for what we're dealing with with Alex Cox. Whenever there was a problem or a threat to Lori Vallow, you'll hear testimony that Alex Cox came to the rescue. But Alex Cox would 
run without even question it never was necessary to solve Lori Vallow's problems. All the way down to her talking about zombies, the zombies that the kids are zombies. Okay, no questions asked us. What do we need to do? Now, I'm not saying that I've heard evidence of that, but seemingly for the pattern that's going on here, it almost seems like it went that way of, oh, well, the kids have to go. Okay, Alex, it's your job. And what's scary and sad is to think of how much they used him and then threw him away. You know what I'm saying? It's like, this is someone, this was her brother. You know, I mean, I don't expect Chad to have much empathy or sympathy towards another human being, even though he claims to, you know, with all his little stupid books that he wrote and whatnot and his superpowers or whatever um clearly he has zero respect for human life zero i mean in the negative right and the prosecuting attorney mentioned this yes chad dable at that point was coming in january and february started to have communications with Lori Vallow. and yes folks it turned into an inappropriate relationship oh my word now remember basically he's gonna probably be looking at it like so Lori forced Chad to have an affair. He would never have done this had it not been for Lori. You know, okay, Jan, sure. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But again, Pryor has to just go by the facts, go by this. He can try and paint Chad to be this person like that. It's been an argument this whole time, and when I say argument discussion or whatever in the comments on you know talking to people. Who do we think manipulated who the most? Who do you think would flip on who the most? You know, because at one point it's like, oh, Chad must have been a really big manipulator. But then you hear him talk and kind of interact and you're like, yikes. You know, and then you see how Lori is and it's like she probably was very you know, manipulative but also could lead Chad around pretty easy because she probably was like to him like a trophy wife, right? Yeah, he she probably in his role was like the hottest thing. And there's probably a level of naughtiness because it sounds like he was more, I, I don't know what you call it, like more strict with his religion, more, you know, following it. And someone like Lori seemed, well, a little bit saucy around the edges. And the same for Brandon Boudreau. You will hear that Chad Daybell is not being pursued for any involvement in Brandon Boudreaux attempted murder. Now, Brandon Boudreaux was Lori's nephew-in-law. What do you call that? It was her niece's former husband. Whatever you call it, I can't think of it right now, but that's the relation there, right? Um, notice he says, you know, Chad wasn't involved in that. Chad wasn't involved in this. Chad wasn't involved in that over here. Don't get that mixed up. Now, again, as a defense attorney, yes, you want them to bring all this up. Because this case is so blurry and gray, right? It's like some of it's like we don't we can't say who put their hands on who or who did this or what was manipulation or this type thing. You know, and some of it you can just sit here. I mean, there's physical evidence of people being on certain things, right? Um, so it's like, okay, so what, how do you handle that? But for him as a defense, I get it. He's going to be like, mm-mm. Don't consider Chad for any of this stuff. Get rid of all the speculation. Get rid of all the side noise you've heard. We're only focused on this. And as we're getting ready to hear him say, you know, and then here's the actual evidence of it. So what we have is we have a situation where someone who's 29 years old, Chad Dabell, 29 years of marriage with Tammy Dabell, no discernible issues in his life. And then Lori Vallow comes in the picture, Miss Texas. You'll hear testimony about this beautiful, vivacious woman, very sexual person, and very manipulative. Okay. Miss Texas. Oh, the shock. Um, you heard him. Very, you know, sensual by the other word. Um, very manipulative. So he's already laid the groundwork for she is you know, she is the devil himself, right? Which, I mean, hey, we're not far off on that, okay? <laughs> From what I've seen, you know. But it's interesting to see the narrative that he's going with this because can, what if the jury buys it? You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I want to see the evidence. What if the jury buys this? You know, it'll be very interesting to see how they go for it. Now, also, again, it's interesting to see how he's kind of trying to pivot Chad as like an innocent bystander that was completely manipulated by this well, Coral War. And she knows how to get what she wants. And she drew, drew Chad Daybell into a relationship and an unfortunate relationship, you know, that Chad fell, fell into. 
I just, I don't have my eyes roll cut, but good God, this is a moment for it. Can't roll my eyes hard enough. She drove him into a relationship that he fell into. I think he went screaming with his arms wide open, right? He dove head first into this when he saw he could have it. This was naughty. This was different. This was exciting, right? He jumped head first, and you heard the tech, the loins of fire book. I mean, my God, right? He was smitten with her. So this is where Pryor needs to reel it in a little bit because there's only so much BS. Now, again, some of these jurors might not be as versed with this case as we are to be like, um, I don't think he was forced into this relationship, dude. You know what I'm saying? That's what kind of makes me nervous about it, to be honest. After that, things started rolling, and issues started happening, but eventually, yes. There was a murder, and there was a burial. And you've heard discussion about the backyard of Chad Davon. Well, we have a four and a half acre farm in Fremont County, Idaho. And you'll hear testimony that the body of J.J. Vallow was discovered behind an irrigation pond and a tree out in the pasture. So technically, yes, maybe the backyard, but more accurately described as the pasture hidden behind a tree. Okay. So now this is the part that we need to get into the case. Obviously, now it's obviously you've already if you've been watching, it's gone on a few days. Yes, this did lead to an M and a burial. Okay. Why? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We've gone from having an affair with a harlequin to JJ's in the backyard, you know. Now let's talk about the term backyard. It's very interesting. Now, again, I get he is the defense attorney. I I get this, right? Whether I like him or not. It is his job to pick this thing apart. We would all want that 100% get it. So when I come at it from my non-professional sofa opinion here, okay, um, it's just that. It's just my, my hot take on it, okay? So, but him sitting here saying like, okay, we have a four and a half acre farm, you know, and I'm sitting here thinking like, okay, we have almost a little more than that out here acreage wise, right? Yes, somebody could go do something on this property. I would not see them doing it. I would have no clue, right? Okay, that being said, they're acting like it's this level of, Oh, way off in the distance. There is a certain degree, especially when you look at how his place was laid out. This place here is like full of woods, right? Chad's isn't. So I'm just like, you're trying to tell me you wouldn't notice that because there are certain things here that I might not notice right away, but I would notice, right? You kind of meander around and walk around and make sure everything's, you know, trees aren't rotten, this kind of stuff. What I'm getting at is four and a half acres is not that much, right? To not complete, to be completely unaware of what's taking place on your property. Secondly, he's like, well, this was, you know, I mean, this is a pasture, you know, this was, you know, this was in the backyard. And so think of the terminology and the imagery. And again, I get it. When you say backyard, you think open sliding glass door, walk down, bam, here in the backyard versus, oh, I got to walk down the driveway. Like for, I'm thinking for myself, right? I got to go down the driveway and that's the equivalent, which I get there's a distinction because it would be like, huh? But nonetheless, the way this was done, it's like, how did you, if you didn't know any of this, how would you not have seen something, especially the area? Now, also behind a tree. Again, these are all things that you're going to want your prosecutor, your defense attorney to do. If it was you, I get it. If it was me, whatever. Um, but it's just funny to listen to him, to how he's trying to decipher this and pick it apart to make it like, well, look, Chad, and, I mean, this is how I read into it. Alex and Lori or Alex, I mean, they could have gone and done this. They've been there numerous times. He wouldn't have known what was going on. You're going to hear testimony that also in the middle of this pasture was a raspberry patch, former raspberry patch that was then turned into a, uh, a place for them to bury the cats, the dogs, and all of the animals on the farm. Okay. Again, out in the pasture of the field and not the backyard. You'll hear testimony about that. Again, he's just wanting to, you know, Backyard, pasture, field, all this type of stuff. Yes, they had a pet cemetery out there. Yes, it made this all the much more creepier, surreal, and heartbreaking to be like, you know, you put the kids essentially in the pet cemetery. Seriously, this is what they meant to you. 
You know, obviously it didn't mean anything, right? Uh, or else this would have never have happened. Uh, but it was just that other level of shock because here's the, the thing that in the, the day when you start seeing Pet Cemetery, what do you think of, right? That movie, okay? You know, it's just haunting, you know? And especially in the movie, if you watched it, where they go and put people in the Pet Cemetery to bring them back, you know? And then you get all these weird religious things that they're talking about in here. And when this first hit, the um, the papers, the media, whatever you want to call it, it had that vibe of like, what? I mean, what kind of madness are we dealing with? But now we just see, for people who were doing such atrocious, horrible things, they really didn't try to hide it that much. Because he is the guy. And Dr. Ham Hankian is going to talk a little bit about the DNA evidence that's found on the scene. Dr. Ham Hankian is going to talk about the fingerprint on the plastic that J.J. Vallow was discovered in was that of Alex Cox. Dr. Hampinkian is going to talk about the hair sample that was found on the plastic of Alex Cox and that it was Lori Vallow. So you see right here where they're going. First of all, no DNA, hair from Lori, nothing from Chad, nothing, nothing, nothing. And again, if you were in Chad's position, if I was in Chad's position, I would want him to say all this stuff too, right? It doesn't help that the kids were in his backyard. Okay, you can't get around that. I don't care if you want to call it a field or his backyard or a pet cemetery or what. You just can't get around that. For him to sit here and then say, with all the evidence, the phone calls, of how much he's like, the kids are this. John Pryor is going to have to completely paint a picture of Chad being bamboozled and being like, well, Lori told me the kids were in such and such, you know, and I'm assuming he's gone through the evidence and, and to make sure he can do that, pull that off. You know what I'm saying? Because to me, that's the only thing that, that you could say at this point, you know, you just, again, you cannot get around the children being buried in the backyard. And then all of the evidence in the reading between the lines of the evidence between Chad and Lori and their relationship and all the bodies that piled up around them. John Pryor will also turn this conversation about evidence, physical, all this type of stuff to Tammy Daybell. Remember I was like, oh, you know, they, it, that was always been so murky as to how she really died. Chad and his children, all of them say natural causes. She wasn't doing well, this type of thing. Most of us can sit here and say, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh. We really believe this one, but let's hear what Pryor has to say about it. And what Dr. Raven is going to say is that there's no indication that this is either a homicide or any other crime and that the only conclusion she could come to is you can't determine what the cause of death was. Again, here you go. Now, each side, remember, this is just the defense's openings, right? The state already had their opening. They did the whole, you know, we're talking about this in chapters. It's a story. They're going to each have people that come up and give their, you know, conflicting testimony against one another. You know, with John Pryor, I'm like, okay, well, let's hear what the, who are your professionals and what do they have to say? You're going to hear testimony from the Daybell children from the children themselves, four of the five children, I think, three, three or four of the five children are going to testify. They're going to talk about their mother's health struggles. They're going to talk about their mother's use of various medicinal uh, uh, treatments that she would use, oils that she would put on her leg, medicine and, and, and different herbs that she would take. So first of all, you know, various amounts of his children are going to get up. Uh, not all of them, but a few of them to testify. I'm very curious to see what they have to say, how much they're sticking behind their father still. Secondly, you heard that she took medicinal stuff. She wrote ointment on her legs. I think this is the narrative that John Pryor is going to go with is that basically she, and she would also say, you know, she won't go to a doctor, so on and so forth. She was basically trying to do these like at home things and she passed away. You know, however, other witnesses will be like, we just talked to her. You know what I'm saying? Like, she she what she passed away like huh it didn't make sense to a lot of people again you cannot tell me i she's in the same category with alex me you cannot tell me they did not have something to do with her death Lori was shopping for wedding rings while she was still alive i mean come on right do the math on it but again it's john Pryor's client i get he has his job is to get him out of trouble because you are going to hear testimony that alex cox went to Chad Daybell's property on the 9th of September. 
You're going to hear that Alex Cox approached Chad Daniels' property a half a dozen other, five or six other times. You're going to hear testimony that Alex Cox was there on the 23rd. And you're going to hear where Alex Cox was in a number of other times and places in his whereabouts and his travels for about a two, two and a half month period. Okay, so with Alex, again, for people who were doing this kind of stuff and who would plan some of the stuff out and seemingly would try and hide stuff, there's other things like that where he just didn't care. It's like he was going, I mean, you got pings all the way up to the, the burial sites almost, you know what I'm saying? He didn't seem to care about hiding some things and other things they did, which is what blows my mind. So those are all the clips I want to look at, but now I just want to kind of round it back out. You know, again, in our discussions and comment sections, live chats, wherever we've communicated in my own private thoughts and in my own private life, this has kind of been the direction I thought this was going. I'm like, his only defense is to blame it on Lori and Alex, right? Period. End of story. Um, the children were buried in a yard. He can try and score them out of that. I get that. I'm sorry, in his backfield, you know, but at the end of the day, he can try and play this off on Lori and Alex. Lori's been convicted. Alex is no longer here. They both were using Alex as their pawn, as their lapdog. And again, I'll say this one more time. I wonder if in the end, if Alex said, oh, it was all a sham. I've been taken. Or if he was right at the end, I have to take my life to protect them for this very reason that we're seeing play out right now. Because imagine if he was alive what that would look like if he had to take the stand and testify. Would he do it the whole nine yards, right? So again, I think uh, John Pryor has done his job, but he's made some tall claims. We'll have to see what kind of evidence he backs them up with because it's, you know, it's going to be a very steep hill to climb. The evidence does not look good at all. You cannot sit here and try and tell me that, you know, Chad was this innocent bystander and Lori came in and manipulated him into this adulterous affair with her. And then she wanted to get back at him and did this and did that and blah, blah, blah. I mean who knows what direction they'll go with it right I don't believe any of it I think that Chad and Lori were two absolute just bad energy vibe people to get connected and when they did it was an explosion and everyone around them suffered the fallout so let me know what you think about the defense's opening statements were you expecting it were you not which direction do you think it will go i do appreciate you watching and uh Roscoe says thank you he asks that you drop a few of those sofas off in the comment section so we'll have a place to sit while we talk about this case and others and until we do pew, We'll see y'all soon. I just wanted to say thank you again for watching the whole video and also thank you for being part of the Sofa Squad. Special thanks to all the Patreon members, channel members from both of my channels, everybody who likes, shares, subscribes, comments in the comment sections. It helps the channel out so much. Now, don't forget, I do have that other channel, the podcast channel. That's where we go live, we hang out, we talk. Uh, we have kind of sort of a schedule, but just be sure and check it out. I'll put it up here on the screen. Also, if you're looking for merch, be sure to check out my Teespring store i'll put that up here and then like i said in the beginning of the video if you want to follow me and roscoe on the insta on the gram on the instagram go on check it out it's right here on the screen again but once again thank you very much i really appreciate you being part of the sofa squad and i'll see you in the next video